we're going to take a look at how the Retroid Pocket 2 Plus handles GameCube emulation. One of the things I was looking forward to the most when I got my Retroid Pocket 2 Plus was being able to play GameCube and PlayStation 2 games on it. A full review will be coming at the end of the week, but for now let's have a quick look at how this console handles GameCube emulation, and in the following video we'll be checking out PS2, Dreamcast and N64 as well. Now we're looking at The Legend of Zelda Wind Waker, and you can see on the start menu it's not terrible, it is a little bit choppy, you can see the graphics are a bit choppy, and the audio is a little bit as well, but what you can see is that we're not getting over 30 frames per second. Now this means the game is playable, but it's not ideal, it's not perfect, and this is going to be the theme for a lot of GameCube games that we're going to see in this test. Now you can see as the cutscenes are panning around, you can see that jumpiness as the frame rate is suffering a little bit. There is also a bit of a weird pattern that's showing, that's coming from my recording as opposed to the actual console itself, that isn't present on the console. But we can see with it struggling to get over 30 frames per second and at some point dropping at about 20 frames per second as well, it means that the experience is choppy in terms of the graphical fidelity. Now as you can see, you can move Link around with no problem with ease, but you can see it's struggling a little bit. You can see the Retroid Pocket 2 Plus is punching above its weight here. Now for me, I'm a very forgiving gamer. I could comfortably play through this uh, and, and enjoy the experience, but I would be constantly aware that the system is struggling a bit because you can see it, it's a little bit slower. It's a little bit slower than intended. It looks a little bit like it's stuttering. Next up we have Mario Kart Double Dash and on the start menu it looks great, 60 frames per second no problem but as we press start and go through the menus you start to notice a little bit of stuttering and then as we get into the actual racing itself the frames per second drop down to the around about 40 frames per second mark. Now this means that the racing again is perfectly acceptable, however when it comes to a racing game it is a bit more noticeable and it does affect the gameplay more than it does a game like Legend of Zelda Wind Waker. I found myself comfortably playing through the 50cc races but as we'd get to the faster races I'm pretty sure this would be quite difficult and as you notice as well the button mapping is a little bit awkward having to press the Y button to shoot out any of your, your pickups is a little bit tricky and, and when you play in an easy level on 50cc that's not too hard to do but if you're racing and trying your best to beat the field you're going to find it tricky it's going to pull you back and hinder you if you have to press Y to shoot at them as well. But from a graphical and audio emulation perspective, again we can see the Retro Pocket 2 Plus is punching way above its weight, but doing pretty damn well to be fair. Next up we have Need for Speed Underground, and this is where things really start to struggle. As soon as the graphics kick in on the main menu, you already start to see the stuttering and the difficulty, and it's noticeable in the audio as well. And let's be honest, with a killer soundtrack like Need for Speed Underground, you want to be able to hear that audio in crystal clarity. When you jump into the actual gameplay itself, it is absolutely unplayable, with the frames per second dropping to at maximum 15, and for a racing game, this is completely unplayable. Now you can understand why this is the case, just looking at the graphics, you can see Need for Speed Underground is one of the higher end GameCube games, so it's definitely going to push the Retro Pocket 2 Plus, and I would have been really surprised if this was going to be playable. I'm gutted that it isn't, I was hoping it would, but I'm not surprised that it's not. Following on, we've got NBA Street Volume 2, and again, this is very similar to Need for Speed Underground. It's not quite as bad, but the stuttering and the slowness in this for a game that needs to be fast-paced means that it's just completely unplayable. This is not the way NBA Street Volume 2 is meant to be played, and trying to play it like this is just not an enjoyable experience. It feels like you're walking through mud, and you can't perform your tricks, you can't time your passes. It's just not a pleasant experience, and this is it running at 30 frames per second as well. So it gives you a good comparison of what it feels like playing a game like Legend of Zelda Wind Waker at 35 frames per second compared to a game like NBA Street Volume 2 at 35 frames per second. It is entirely dependent on the game as to how much of an effect it's going to have. And when we come to Pokemon XD Gale of Darkness, it gets even worse. With the actual cutscenes running themselves at around about 15 frames per second means they are so difficult to watch, but not only that, the audio in this is absolutely butchered. You, it's so painful to actually try to listen to it. The battles are no better as well, and considering these battles are turn-based, which you think would be able to, to be able to deal with a slower, more stuttery kind of experience better, they don't. It's just really difficult and awkward to play. 
On top of that, when you get to the actual main game itself, trying to move your character around, it just continues to be the same issue. With the frame rate running at that 15 frames per second, it's just so difficult to play and move around. And not only that, there seems to be a bit of a glitch. I don't know if it's with this ROM, or I don't know if it's with the Retro Pocket 2 Plus, but whenever you hold down on the analog stick, the character still goes up. Uh, you need to use the D-pad to move them around, and it's a really weird glitch. Now, the RG552 from Ambenic didn't run this game any better, but it didn't have that issue with the analog stick, so I do think that's something specific to the mapping of the Retro Pocket 2 Plus. But it's not all doom and gloom. Simpsons hit and run, although this runs, again, at average on around about 30 to maybe 45 frames per second. This is a completely enjoyable experience. And like I said earlier in this video, I am a lot more forgiving when it comes to gaming in terms of being able to, to experience and enjoy a game that isn't running at peak performance. So I will caveat it with the fact that there will be people out there that will notice these issues and won't enjoy it. But I have played through Simpsons Hit and Run and I'm probably about 75% of the way through this game entirely on the Retro Pocket 2 Plus and I have enjoyed every single minute of it. Is it perfect emulation? Absolutely not. Is it enjoyable? Heck yes. And I am absolutely loving playing through Simpsons Hit and Run on the Retro Pocket 2 Plus. Now, if you want a full review of this device, make sure you are subscribed so you don't miss out on that. And we'll be checking out the PS2 emulation soon as well.